so that the topic of free will, <clears throat> I mean, one can approach that in so many ways, but I suspect that um, you will have encountered certain challenges to the belief in free will, uh, particularly from the side of science and particularly brain science and, you know, I mean, uh, brain MRIs, you know, and um, brain scans that seem to show there's no free will. That's sort of the claim. And I'll come to some of that um, in a moment. Um, so I just want to show you how one can think about that, part of which is to take a step back from that, you know, not just looking through the microscope at the brain. You may lose the bigger picture there. And so just to begin that, uh, I just want to ask, you know, a more cultural and political kind of question first, perhaps, you know, the <clears throat> social kind of question. Um, because there, too, we talk about freedom. You know, freedom is also a political term, and we want to uh, think what that means. And if you look at our culture, choice and freedom is actually a big thing. People want their autonomy to be acknowledged. They want many things in their life to be there, free choice that should not be interfered with by any kind of authority. Uh, we talk about free speech, for example. This is Berkeley campus after all, right? So there is a lot of uh, freedom in that as well, so much so that uh, we even think that's a very high value, if not the highest one. Choice is sort of um, what embodies our autonomy and it seems our dignity as free people. And so these kind of preferences that we find so important um, uh, have something to do with, with freedom, it seems. And yet, let's say we have all these choices, and there are a lot of questions about that. Um, but let's say we do indeed have all these choices and uh, the freedom of our preferences. Then there is still the question, what do we do with our freedom? Now you have all the freedom of choice. Where do you go with that? What do you really want? Why is that even a question? If freedom and free choice were an end in itself, this question would not arise. There is a use of freedom, and, but it is not yet decided what it is to be used for. That would be the further end for which you use freedom as a means. And that is indeed what I want to claim, first of all. Our free choice is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. And we value it not for its own sake, but for the sake of what we achieve through it. <clears throat> and that is still the question. What do we want with that? <clears throat> and we typically want something good. Right? Nobody wants to choose something bad for its own sake. And Aristotle and others will have a term that covers all the possible goods that we could desire in life. And that is what he calls happiness. Happiness is sort of the sum total of all the goods that we want to pursue. It is the flourishing of a life. It is the life that is worth living. And so that is then the question, what does happiness consist in? And I'm not going to answer that question right now, I just want us to notice there is something for which freedom is there for, and that is the good. Nobody wants to be unhappy, and we don't use our free will to pursue unhappiness for its own sake, like, like frantically pursuing our unhappiness. That wouldn't make any sense, right? Uh, whatever we pursue is that which we think is the good. That's just the very nature and the very structure of it. And so... There is then a, a further end for which freedom and free choice is the means. And because of that, sometimes people are also willing to give up their freedom if they can get that end without it. And I'm a little disconcerted because I hear, you know, polls and so forth showing that uh, young people are often not even interested in their political freedom anymore as long as, you know, uh, sort of the state can provide all the amenities and niceness that they could want for their life. But there is an element of truth in that because, again, our free choice is there for an end or for a purpose. Now we can uh, then look at that in political terms as well. So if we see our freedom in political terms as a freedom from the interference by the state. So again, I want my autonomy, I want my free choice, and I pursue something with that but it is something that is independent from the state, and the state is sort of a threat to that. That means I still pursue a good, but I think that this good is something private and personal to me. 
It does not have to do with the larger community out there. And it is indeed one way in which to look at that. Libertarians will do that typically. On the other hand, we may notice that we are also communal and political animals. So Aristotle will notice that. We have reason and we have language and we have that so that we can communicate and that we can coordinate our efforts and cooperate. And indeed to bring about a good that is greater than what we could do on our own. And that is what we call the common good. That is the good in which we share. And if we then ask what freedom consists in, it is the freedom to be able to participate in this common good. And we will, would feel rather set back if we were not allowed to participate in that which is communal here. And we would feel a fulfillment of our freedom in that participation. That is how ancient Athens, for example, understood what freedom meant. Now we can take that even in a wider kind of sense and ask what is the ultimate common good, the most universal good of all, in which then our happiness would consist. And that, Thomas Aquinas would say, is God. God is the sum total of all goodness, all at once, if you want, and we are called, Thomas Aquinas would say, to participate precisely in that good, to participate in the life of God. And so it is only in our relationship with God then that also our freedom comes to fulfillment. And here is where we indeed talk about our free will. Our free will finds its fulfillment in the love of God. We love the good, and God is the ultimate good, the fullness of goodness. And that is where true freedom finally becomes apparent. And to illustrate that, um, I wonder if you have ever thought about, you know, if I let this drop, I won't because it's too loud. <laughs> but uh, if I drop, uh, you know, a heavy object, it falls to the ground. <clears throat> and how do we call that? We call that free fall. Right? Why do we call that free fall? Well, because there is no obstacle that gets in the way of the object going to the place to which it wants to go by its very nature. That is how Aristotle explains gravity, for example. Uh, it has a natural place, that means a place to which it wants to go uh, by its nature, and that is the center of gravity. And freedom then means to be able to pursue one's good or goal or natural place that, uh, that we have by virtue of who we are and what our nature is. And that is true not just for stones, that is true for us as well. And Aristotle would say that something that goes against the nature of this free fall is what we call violence. Violence is the counter term to freedom. And so we have to understand what freedom is also in contrast with what violence is. And so Aristotle talks about this in terms that we might not usually think of, but if I would throw this thing at you, that's not free fall. I impress emotion on that which does not accord with its nature, but which does goes contrary to the nature and therefore does violence to the nature of the thing. Right? So and that is why <clears throat> violence cannot be understood except by contrast with nature and the freedom of that nature to pursue its end and goal. And I do think that is actually important for understanding what for us free will means because we also have our natural place towards which we gravitate. And that place, as St. Augustine would say, is God. And we pursue it by our own kind of inclination, this time not you know, like the stone to the ground, but towards God. And that inclination is what we call love. And so that's why um, uh, St. Augustine says, you know, our, our heart is restless until it rests in you, O oh God. And that is our natural place. And uh, St. Augustine makes that parallel and says, amor meus pondus meus. My love is my weight. Like the stone has a weight to fall to the ground, our heart has a weight or an inclination that draws, that is drawn to its own center of gravity, which is God. And if that is fulfilled, then we are truly free. And sort of a gravitation upwards, if you want. And in that, if we are then in our place where we want to gravitate towards, if we encounter God, 
then indeed uh, we cannot choose otherwise anymore because then our freedom, our desire is fulfilled. We have that happiness for which all the other choices are only a means. And that is why Thomas Aquinas says, once we are face to face with God, we cannot fall out of that anymore. That is part of our happiness to know that we cannot choose against God once we are face to face with him. So that's an important point because that means uh, in heaven, I don't have free choice anymore. And yet that is precisely because my freedom is fulfilled. All the free choices I make in this life have a value only because I want to achieve that end in which then my choices end as well. And that's a dimension of freedom and the free will problem that is, of course, not typically considered in philosophical discussions today, but I think actually that the whole notion of free will becomes incomprehensible apart from that. Many of the discussions people have about compatibilism, incompatibilism, uh, sort of uh, are blind to that background and, and, um, and that ends for that reason. And so that's why I, just to begin with, want to give you this bigger scope of, of that question. It's a, what they call a teleological notion of freedom. I am free if I have what I want. And if I'm falling like the stone to the ground, I fall into God, basically. And only then can I be truly happy. If I were able to still choose against God in heaven, I would always be worried, you know, that I, you know, may actually fall again, you know, that this may not last. I would be insecure about the whole thing. And then I would actually not be truly happy. True happiness does not uh, go together with the fear of losing it again. Right? But you cannot lose it uh, for any extraneous kind of uh, reasons, but only because by its very nature you have what you want. There's no reason for you to choose otherwise anymore. It's a fulfillment of your will. And only something violent could wrestle you out of that, but that would be against God. So that could not possibly happen. So that is, uh, I think, first of all, a background that I want to give you before we now zero in a little bit further on the brain kind of question, <laughs> which, of course, you know, if you look at a brain scan, that question will not occur to you. But I think, first of all, that needs to be a background, and you will see why. So but the typical challenge then today, as I said, uh, often is raised from the side of science. And um, the famous example is the experiment of Benjamin Libet in 1985. Um, I, I heard in UC Berkeley, I mean, uh, undergraduates get confronted with that, and then they lose their belief in free will. So <laughs> hence, I want to talk about that. Um, but so the experiment is, um, he puts people in a laboratory and asks them to wiggle their finger or move a, a finger within 30, uh, with any time, in, uh, in any time within 30 seconds without planning ahead. You just uh, do that whenever, he says, when you are first aware of a wish or urge to do so, to act with, with wiggling the finger. And then you press a button and you observe a clock at the same time. And, uh, and so the people can take the time from when you feel that urge and then wiggle your finger. At the same time, your brain would be monitored by the scientists and uh, for its activity. And what they find then is even before you're consciously aware of an urge to act, your brain is already doing something. There's a brain activity that they can measure, and that's what they call the readiness potential because it gets you ready to have these experiences then act on it. Now, um, this precedes your conscious awareness and action. Does that mean that you are not acting at all, but your brain makes you do it, right? And if so, do you still have free choice? Or are you just the marionette of your neurophysiology in your brain, basically? And so at first sight, that indeed seems startling and uh, disconcerting if you want to believe in free will. Um, and so many people are actually looking at that and you know, drop the, their very belief in free will. Um, but I want to show you that this is a misunderstanding. And first of all, I want to make some preliminary observations about um, uh, what's going on here and uh, what the results might be. 
um, I mean, just in ordinary life, you may raise the question, you know, what happens actually if you stop believing in free will? Is that a, what, how does it affect us? And uh, people have done experiments on that too. And they found that um, if people stop if people stop believing in free will, uh, then they will also be more likely to cheat on tests uh, because they don't they own their own responsibility anymore. Um, on the other hand, people say, well, maybe the, the upside is you gain more empathy for people who cannot help themselves and do these kind of things. You know? So um, maybe you, know, you should have more sympathy for them and rather than judging them and so forth. Um, that is uh, certainly true too, but um, that means also um, you can empathize with the criminal, but you also are starting to think about the victims in a different way because every victim is also potential criminal law. You know? And you could potentially monitor people not for things they have done, but for things they may do for future crimes. Maybe you know the movie Minority Report, you know, something like that. You know, so you uh, basically uh, anticipate that because you've studied their brain, they have all the brain scans and maybe the genetics and so forth that drives them. And so you take them out before they can do something and put them in jail before they even do something. Um, and uh, in, in fact, you know, um, courts of law are now affected by these kind of studies and uh, sentencing is um, uh, changing uh, based on that. So there are real life kind of applications to these kind of studies. But the, the experiment itself um, does suffer from certain uh, problems, just to begin with, with measuring kind of problems. The accuracy is not that terribly high. And one could make some arguments about that. And it's merely a probability that may not force you to act on it. So people have made these kind of arguments. Um, I'll just leave that. Uh, that's not the main argument I, I wish to make here. Um, another question that may arise, and I'll come back to that in a moment, is what, the only thing that you observe, first of all, is that something precedes another thing. That is, something is lightening up in your brain, and that is followed by your experience and maybe you're wiggling the finger. But something being followed by another thing is not necessarily a causal relation. So that A precedes B does not mean that A is the cause of B. And a simple example would be uh, night is always followed by day. But does that mean that the night causes day to occur? No. And it's just the regular kind of sequence of events. That's not necessarily a form of causality. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. Another thing to observe with some of these studies is there is some hasty generalization uh, going on, from, often from uh, pathological studies. So people uh, like to quote examples of people with brain damage, you know, people having a beam going through the brain or something like that, and they de uh, develop all sorts of bizarre behavior and so forth and so on. But uh, in all of these cases, you take an, a case that is not the normal case and say all the normal cases are like it. And so you basically generalize on pathologies. And uh, so, for example, people look at schizophrenia and people attributing a causality to things that don't uh, are really the causes of things, or they think they make something happen that they don't make happen, and then they say, "Well, maybe that's true for all of our actions." You know, it's just like a schizophrenic kind of projection. Well, that doesn't follow. I mean, you just take a pathological case and say all the cases are like that. That simply does not follow. Or um, maybe you do know the movie Doctor Strange Love. You know, from Stanley Kubrick, and there's always, you know, he's trying, always trying to do the Hitler salute, you know, and, uh, and trying to keep his arm down. That's sort of the alien hand syndrome, right? And, uh, and so, yeah, our limbs do things that we don't want them to do, but is that the normal case? Are we always acting like that? Are we always taken over by alien kind of things in our body that make us do certain things that just simply doesn't follow? And yet people are strangely uh, um, infatuated with those kind of examples. But in most of these cases, we would actually be surprised by what we suddenly do, our arm rising and things like that. Whereas in the cases of free will, when we actually choose to do something, we are not surprised by what we do. We just have chosen it, right? That shouldn't surprise us. And so these are not induced false beliefs as in pathological cases or confabulations, as people call that, where we you know, just imagine we have 
chosen something even though something else was going on. If all of our actions would be of that sort, then those theories themselves would be confabulations of that sort. Because what is true for what the scientist is studying would be true for the scientist himself. And that's actually the very f the first actually argument um, that science itself, even if its results seem to deny free will, presuppose free will. Why so? Well, uh, one uh, study that I looked at, I mean, the, the scientist says, you know, we observe the brain and all the things that come from the brain activity. And he says, well, there's no distinction in observations between conscious action, reflex, and disease. In the brain, they all look alike. You know, pathological actions, um, free choices, um, mere reflexes and so forth, they all look alike in the brain. You cannot distinguish that just based on the material stuff. Now, what that means, if that is all that you work with, is that neuroscience itself is indistinguishable from reflex and disease. Do you want to say that? Because if everything is operating just by these um, readiness potentials, that would be true for Benjamin Libet's uh, brain too, you know, the, the, the scientist's brain. Um, both scientific insights and scientific mistakes have neural correlates. They look alike in the brain. In both cases, the brain is firing and something is going on. How do you distinguish one from the other just by looking at that? Um, an example from Edmund Husserl, the phenomenologist, you know, may have to clarify that. I mean, <clears throat> this was before the time of computers, but he talked about calculation machines. You, know, so gets, uh, you can also think, you know, a, a calculator, right? And so they're programmed to do uh, arithmetic. And so one always spits out 2 plus 2 is 4, and the other spits out 2 plus 2 is 5, consistently. Well, you would say one is programmed in the wrong way. Well, based on what? Based on this, the, the laws of electromechanics? No, the laws of electromechanics operate in both cases, in both uh, calculators. In both cases, they're not broken. What is broken are the laws of arithmetic. But these laws are of a very different kind. These laws you can actually break. Whenever you miscalculate, you do that. But if you want to evaluate which calculator goes right, you don't do that by pointing to the laws of electromechanics, but to the laws of arithmetic. Now, if you transpose that to the brain, the brain has laws of, say, neurophysiology that um, operate in some kind of way. And you can think 2 plus 2 is 4, and you can also think 2 plus 2 is 5, and both look alike. The difference is not in your brain states or on the laws that operate there, but in the laws of arithmetic that you're trying to follow. But in order to follow the laws of arithmetic, you must be free from where your brain is trying to drag you in the meanwhile. You must have the freedom to follow the laws of logic, arithmetic, geometry, or whatever it is, normative kind of considerations, and not the laws of, of nature and mechanics or neurophysiology or whatever the case may be. So in other words, you must be free from these in order to think about and evaluate which kind of states are the correct ones. <clears throat> and that means you have to be free in order to do that kind of science. And that includes the science of neurophysiology as well. If you want to argue for that, you cannot be bound by what your brain dictates to you. That which is rational and rational as an argument cannot be the effect of something irrational. And so... Um, Science itself must claim what, it, in this case, it seems to deny. That's a problem for this kind of science. Not only that, um, secondly, this is not just about the truth of the claim, but the very meaning of the claim of determinism. You can say that and say, well, our brain shows us we are determined, but what does that even mean? If you, if you are asked to define what determinism means, you know, maybe you are necessitated to do something, but what does that mean? And uh, I think it was Henri Bergson who first uh, pointed that out. You would have to appeal 
uh, to a sense of possibility in negating it. So one way of defining determinism is there are no possible alternatives. Right? There are, um, you rule out alternative possibilities and you are fixed with that one uh, of that. And we can think, maybe you can come up with another definition. I cannot think of any other one, which means the very notion of necessity must be defined in terms of possibility. Possibility is the more fundamental term. I think we get it from ourselves. The, the experience of ourselves having very, a range of possibility that is precisely not determined. And the, the, what we call determinism is a negation of these possibilities. And the space of these possibilities is therefore wider than um, the space of determinism. And that is true even in a kind of a um, um, social kind of sense or in what they call the life world. And the life world is sort of the world in which we live, in which we experience our possibilities, in which we move. And um, as the laboratory of Benjamin Libet and others is sort of a part of that, and you can enter into that from the life world and usually come to that with the interest that you have. For example, you make medical experiments to provide medicine for your family. And your family, that's part of your life world. That's where you live. And um, that um, is actually directly relevant to this experiment. This is the space of possibility that is wider than the space of necessity. Here is where you have your laboratory and Benjamin Libet. And where you may then, you know, try to discover laws that are deterministic and so forth. But that is a much narrower kind of field that presupposes what is, so to speak, around it. And the way that comes out in this case is, um, in the experiment, indeed, you don't make any choices. The real choice that doesn't occur in the experiment is the choice wider realm of possibilities. Um, because what do you need to do uh, to enter that experiment as a participant. You have to enter sort of a contract with the experimenter. You would basically promise to cooperate with what he's asking from you. You make a commitment to cooperate and then to report truthfully, you know, where the clock was that's going around or when you wiggle your finger and what, when you feel that urge to act and so forth. Now, the question is, um, what does promising mean? How can you promise if you are not free? If you say in the future, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z, if you're not free, there's no way in which you can guarantee that. Maybe your brain is telling you something else in the meanwhile. Maybe you have suddenly the urge to rebel against the experimenter or something like that, you know, or to falsify the results. In order to be able to promise something and to stand for it, you must be free to actually follow through on your promise. And you know, as John Searle defines it, uh, a promise is something that creates desire independent reasons for action. So independent from desire, that is also from whatever urge your brain is dictating to you, you must be able to follow that promise. Otherwise, whatever you are, are reporting in that experiment is unreliable. The experimenter would never be able to tell whether you actually follow through on your promise. You couldn't be able to tell. Which means the data of the experiments cannot show that you are determined because otherwise the data would be unreliable. You understand that? <laughs> if the data would show that you are determined, the data themselves would be unreliable. That means it's a self-contradiction, right? So the experiment just cannot show that. In order to be a valid experiment, you have to presuppose the freedom to uh, properly participate in it. So <clears throat> that's then another problem. Promise, promise problem. But it has to do with coming from this wider space of possibility and freedom that then allows us to order this more, uh, enter this more narrow space of the experiment. And that's usually not considered. I mean, that's sort of, we just narrowly focus on what's happening within the experiment. Another problem has to do with the very concept of free will. If you don't know what free will is, 
you're looking in the wrong places. How do you know that you find it if you have the wrong notion of that in the first place? You know, but, uh, you, so then, uh, what is the notion that is implied here in Benjamin Libet's experiment? He says that we should wait until we experience an urge to act. You know, when you have this kind of feeling of this urge. Um, now, that, the first thing to notice is that makes it sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, Raymond Teller says that the, the experiment treats individuals as passive respondents to stimuli and then discovers that they are passive respondents to stimuli. <laughs> and what else do you expect? You know, of course, that's what you're looking for. But the problem is, first of all, are we passive bystanders of our own actions? That doesn't make sense, right? An action is something that we do. It's an activity. It's not something that we just that overtakes us or something like that. So the passive formulation itself is a problem. You know, to wait until something arises, that's not what we, how we choose. And there actually were earlier experiments in the 1930s and 40s by Penfield Wilder, excuse me, Wilder Penfield is <laughs> his name, uh, who uh, had opened the skull of patients for uh, unrelated reasons, but took the opportunity to poke the brain and see what people do. And so you could actually stimulate them so that they raise their arm. Okay, maybe we always do that, perhaps, you know. But uh, of course, you can interview the people who are in that situation. And they said quite clearly, no, you did that, not I. They were quite clearly uh, able to distinguish between them deciding to raise their arm and he poking his, their brain and then the arm going up. That's not what we main, mean by, uh, by free will. And interestingly, so you can also then poke the brain and stimulate memories to come up. But what you cannot induce is belief. Memory is suddenly popping up in your brain. But to believe something actually involves some element of freedom and decision to, uh, to actually engage that belief. Belief is not something passive either. So when we're talking about free will, we are talking about an activity. It's not a passive kind of experience. Otherwise, it would be like you know, the urge to sneeze or something like that, that we can uh, suppress perhaps or to vomit. You know? That's not a good paradigm for, for, for free will. And then, of course, to say that it's something like a feeling or an experience. Here we could <clears throat> talk more at length. I mean, for Thomas Aquinas, the intellect and free will are not um, central kind of faculties. They're spiritual faculties, and the, the, the brain is not the organ of that for Aquinas. Uh, feelings do have a material basis. They have uh, so the brain, you have the hormones and things like that going on. And for that, of course, you do have neural correlates. But, um, the, uh, but free will is not of that sort. Whatever we feel, of course, is entangled in physical stuff. But uh, you cannot already claim that that is what free will is. You know, free will, if you conceptualize it properly, would end up being something that doesn't have a physical organ, which uh, therefore can also not be the same um, as a matter of feeling. Now, uh, I do say that also as an objection to other arguments for free will that I would not endorse. So sometimes people say, no, I have free will. I know that quite evidently. I have that experience. No, look, I can raise my arm and I have this experience, right? And But any appeal to this kind of experience in this kind of experiential feeling kind of sense is easily debunked. You know, easily because Benjamin Libert may come in, I can explain to you why you'd have that because that readiness potential is going on in your brain, right? Or something else, you know, and there always have been these arguments already in the past. And so I don't think that's a good argument. Uh, to make a free choice is not necessarily something that feels like anything at all. You may not feel, you may feel nothing you may actually choose against all the feelings that you have at that point. Otherwise, you cannot resist temptations. Right? So you may, in fact, I mean, it's, neither, it's not a feeling, but rather something you can choose against. Feelings are things you can choose against. So I think that is itself conceptually a problem if you think that that is what free will is. And then <clears throat> it leaves out a whole element that is essential to freedom, and that is deliberation. If we choose something, we deliberate, first of all, about what, uh, what to do. And so an example would be, uh, let's say I put two envelopes in front of you. 
and I say in one envelope, there is a $1 million check for you. Okay? The other contains your death sentence. Now choose. <laughs> All right. So you choose one, and lo and behold, it's your death sentence. Right? What, what are you going to say? I didn't want that. Says, of course you did. You chose it. right? I mean, nobody did it for you. You voluntarily chose that. But what? You didn't know what you were choosing. It was not an informed choice. If we don't think we know what we are doing, if our mind is not engaged, if we don't have this rational deliberation, we don't think it is really our choice. Free choice presupposes an act of reason, of the intellect, of the mind that deliberates things. Um, now, notice again uh, the, in what happens in the experiment. Benjamin Libet says uh, you, have to, uh, you have to wiggle your finger without planning ahead and without thinking. That is, the experiment purposely and by definition and instruction eliminates a necessary condition for free choice. Whereas the real free choice, as I just said, has already happened in the life world. It was the choice to participate in the experiment, and that is where the deliberation happened. So planning ahead and deciding in advance did happen, and that is good because only that makes something a free choice. Now, if you see that, and you see the deliberation happening in the larger life world, you may actually also find there is some validity to what Benjamin Libet says. There's a place for that. Because you don't want just to discard something, you want to understand what that actually means. So another uh, example. How did you get out of bed this morning? I want to suggest probably in the same way as Benjamin Libet's experiment works. So you may have set your alarm as a deliberate kind of thing already the night before, right? So it goes off at a certain point. And you wake up, right? and then you have a choice. You can say, OK, I'm going to get up. You could also say, I'm going to defy the world and my obligations and just stay in bed you know, and go to sleep again. Yeah? We hit the snooze button. But um, uh, let's say you choose to get up. You probably don't do that right away. I mean, if you're like me, you need, need a moment, right? I mean, you, maybe your blood circulation is not yet in the right place and so forth. So what do you do? Well, you don't quite know. At a certain point, though, you know you're outside of your bed. You have somehow gotten up. Right? Does that mean that didn't happen freely? No. You did deliberately, deliberately choose to get up, but then you allowed, say, your readiness potentials to decide on the point in time when that was going to happen. Right? And that is a perfectly rational kind of way itself to do that. It's itself uh, a free choice. It's governed by that free choice. And it's not outside of that. And that is similar to the experiment, you know, where the, the, to enter the experiment was the deliberate choice. Now, this uh, uh, understanding is actually um, vindicated by another experiment that was made in 2010. And this was done by Aaron Schurger in the National Institute of Health and Medical Research in Paris, where they looked at the brain again and said, well, OK, these readiness potentials, they're actually going on all the time in your brain. And they're, going, they're coming like um, waves, like also like the weather, or economic kind of developments, and so forth. And um, one can avail them oneself of these fluctuations. Uh, and even uh, apparently chimpanzees do that at times, um, in cases where you have no further reason to choose one or the other. Let's say your deliberation, you have just two envelopes, there's nothing to deliberate about, right? Or you are in the, the supermarket <clears throat> and you have to choose between um, 60 jars of peanut butter. <laughs> They're all alike, you know, which one are you going to choose? Well, there's no rational kind of deliberation to, about that. So you just, you know, do it on a whim. That is, you let your readiness potentials just do that for you. So you tap in to what is going on in your brain to use it for that purpose. But that's not the real causality. There is still the causality of the choice that governs the whole thing. And that brings me back to what I said earlier, that something precedes something is not necessarily the cause of what it precedes. So A is not necessarily the cause of B. These readiness potentials are going on, 
but um, th there's some kind of a causal involvement, but it is uh, something that is used by the real cause, which is your choice. Your choice to let that actually dictate your choice of the peanut butter bar. Now, if you're in the experiment and you're just asked to wiggle your finger, <laughs> that's not much to deliberate about either. <laughs> of course, you're going to use that readiness potential in your brain. <laughs> and that itself is rational to do because there's nothing else to do. It's like a mental coin toss or something like that. So um, that you know, would first of all show that um, what free will means is something else than what the um, experiment presupposes, but you can actually also see that there is a role for what the experiment actually looks at within these kind of choices. But it doesn't undermine at all that we have free will. Now, I don't talk for a moment also about Thomas Aquinas, of course. <laughs> um, so there is free will, and I think one can show that in these ways. But how free are we? Is our freedom unlimited? Jean-Paul Sartre sometimes talks like that. You know? I don't, uh, that's not what Thomas Aquinas suggests. Thomas Aquinas is pretty commonsensical on this whole question. And you can just look you know, at uh, who we are and what we are made of and look at the sort of the range of what we can freely deliberate and, work and act on. There are certain things that are not part of our choice. I cannot choose to run as fast as a cheetah, for example. Right? It's just physically impossible. I cannot choose to levitate. That's just not part of what, what we are made to do. Um, I can also not choose by free choice to stop my heartbeat. Now, maybe some people in India can do that. I don't know. But um, uh, breathing is sort of in between. You, you can breathe voluntarily, but it also happens automatically. But there are some other parts, you know, my digestion, for example, you know, would be sometimes nice if you suffer from indigestion to actually start that by an act of free will, but you cannot, right? There, there are limits to that. And Thomas Aquinas actually discusses all of that and makes quite clear where the, the limits are. And um, our emotions, you know, we can not control our emotions by an act of choice, but we can influence it by rethinking, for example, uh, how we about the objects of our feelings, for example. Or, or if it's temptations, we can just use our ability to uh, move in space you know, to get away from the temptation. So all of these things you will find in Thomas Aquinas. But there's a, another case that I find interesting for our purposes, and that is um, something that is akin to what we call today laws of nature. So if you think that the laws of nature um, you know, Newtonian laws or whatever the laws may be, are deterministic. We are living in a body, uh, and it's a physical uh, entity, and it would be governed by these physical laws. If these laws are deterministic, then we don't have free will, period. That's still a problem. And if that is so, we don't need to do Benjamin Libet's experiments, then you know we are determined. Although, what does that mean? I mean, can you know that if you're not free? You know, that's what I said earlier. But let's say uh, these laws are deterministic, then we have a problem. Right? What would Thomas Aquinas say to that? Well, <clears throat> he did not have that notion because that actually came up only in the 17th century. So mathematic, the laws of nature that are formulated with mathematical equations, that is actually a fairly recent thing. You know, we don't typically realize that because we are so used to that, but that didn't exist in the Middle Ages in these ways. However, there was one thing that is analogous to that, and that is the movement of the celestial spheres. It has to do with the cosmology, so the way that the planets and so forth go around the Earth. And I mean, they thought the Earth was in the center, and so the sun and the planets would go around the Earth. And they do that indeed with mathematical precision. And you can compute that. Computation is actually the word that comes from the medieval observation of that for actually determining the Easter date. Uh, but they, that's predictable, it's regular, and it is, um, goes with precision. They didn't think that here on Earth things worked with that precision, but the heavenly motions. And they thought this has an effect on us. On us. So think of astrology, for example. It sounds like superstition, but that was sort of best available science they had at that time. And it's actually not so unlike what we think, because uh, Thomas Aquinas think basically the movement of the stars has an effect on our, our brain physiology. There you have it. <laughs> brain physiology, like Benjamin Libet. 
so that, for example, you have character types based on that. So if you have a Saturnine kind of temperament, you're melancholic or something like that, or um, choleric if Mars has an influence on you and so forth. Well, we still talk that way. We have character types, we have Myers-Briggs and things like that, by which we study character types. And, but we don't attribute it to the stars. We attribute it to laws of, say, neurophysiology, which, again, are resting on more fundamental laws of physics, for example. It is just that we have flipped sort of the place uh, of this mathematical precision from the, the large-scale macrocosmic kind of uh, level to the microcosmic level and atomic level. Um, but the scenario is not unlike that. In both cases, we have effects on the brain and on our temperament and therefore our behavior. So Thomas Aquinas has a place for that. Um, including that you could spell it out in terms of brain chemistry. And so what does he think about that? Are these laws deterministic? Thomas Aquinas says, and that's, he's not the only one to say that, uh, no, not really, but sort of. Uh, so astra inclinant, non necessitant was the, the phrase. The stars incline you to certain behaviors, but they do necessitate that behavior. So it gives you, it gives you a predisposition, but you don't absolutely necessarily have to act on that. Now, how likely is it that you're going to follow those laws? Here is where Thomas Aquinas is surprisingly pessimistic. He actually thinks that only the wise man is going to resist these impulses and urges. I mean, presumably, the wise person that is using his mind and takes a step back and has a larger kind of picture and can take a step, step away from the immediate kind of impulses that he has. That's perhaps what he has in mind here. But if that is so, then he thinks that the large, uh, um, the numbers of people, the large numbers of people will predictably behave in a certain way. And that explains why we have statistical predictability of sociological phenomena. We do have crime statistics. And that should puzzle us for a moment. Because if something is a crime, uh, then presumably you have done it voluntarily. Otherwise, you wouldn't be punished for it, right? Um, and yet, there's a statistic about that. So it's predictable that people are going to do that. So then, uh, should you be punished or not? Are you free or are you not? And we encounter that every day. Not just crime statistics work that way, but also algorithms on Amazon and Facebook and things like that that want to sell you things. And they predict that you're going to click on certain buttons and purchase certain things if, you know, <clears throat> after they've observed your behavior, you know, they can predict what you are going to like and so forth and so on. And if that didn't work, if people would not actually purchase things based on that, they wouldn't do it. So how free are you? you know, how much is your computer already in your mind and in your choices? It's a little scary to think of that sometimes. But then Aquinas would say, well, only the wise person takes that step back and doesn't click on that clickbait you know, on the internet. Um, so Aquinas actually wouldn't have been surprised by that. Um, now, everyone will be inclined to act on an impulse if we are stressed out. And Aquinas actually talks about that. If you're stressed out, if you're multitasking, if you're caught by surprise, then all your immediate impulses take over, basically. So, um, and he actually thinks that... Um, that is true even for sins. He said, even if you're in the state of grace, you cannot avoid every venial sin. So this is just kind of a statistical kind of model. You, um, so even if you're in the state of grace, um, you will eventually fall into at least a venial sin at some point. And now, does that mean that we are determined? No. Um, here the model is indeed like uh, statistics of if you're rolling dice, and the Jesuits actually explained that in the 16th century, uh, there's a statistical, statistical predictability of the outcome of rolling dice. Right? But it doesn't mean um, that, you, um, that whatever uh, has already happened by rolling dice determines the next move, because every roll of the dice is independent from the previous ones. So Let's say statistically, um, take an example from those Jesuits, if among 1,000 inhabitants of Madrid, at least one per day commits a mortal sin. And let's say it's 11.59 p.m. 
And uh, you're the last one left. 999 inhabitants have not committed a mortal sin. Are you forced to commit that mortal sin? No, of course not. <laughs> um, it's like the roll of dice. I mean, it doesn't determine what you are going to do. Um, it means that you can actually avoid each, say, let's each temptation. In each case, you can refuse uh, to fall into sin. But all together, collectively taken, there's a statistical predictability of that. So that's the, that's the difference. Um, and so, again, I mean, Aquinas is um, fairly pessimistic about the outcome of that. Now, there is another kind of predictability that, I mean, this is a kind of predictability that has to do with our weakness, basically. But there's also predictability that doesn't have to do with weakness, but with something that's actually reasonable. So even if somebody's wise, he or she needs to go and eat sometime during the day, right? And you have to go shopping and so forth, and it's quite predictable that people are going shopping. I mean, economics and economic predictability happens with that. Uh, and that is not because they are deterministically uh, made to do that, you know, or because they lack freedom, but it's because that's the rational choice to make. And that doesn't make you unfree. It's a good reason to eat if you're hungry, unless you have overriding reasons. It's Lent and you're fasting or you're on a diet and so forth. And it could very well be that uh, a wise person has a larger range of reasons to refrain from immediate kind of impulses or needs. Uh, but nevertheless, in the long run, I mean, it's predictable, and uh, but not against freedom that we will act on that. Um, moreover, um, some of our actions are indeed automatic. So if you think of how you came here, let's say you drove with your car or something like that, and you do that, go that way every day, you're not consciously making every move, you know, shifting gears or, you know, taking a particular kind of turn, you have, have habitualized that. Habits um, make us predictable, right? We have developed certain routines. But that's not against our freedom either. So, for example, I think you are playing tennis, right? If you are trying to make every move consciously, you're probably going to miss the ball. You're losing the game, right? You have trained for that. You have uh, uh, trained your reflexes. Your neuroplasticity in your brain basically is trained to react in certain ways. And, um, but that is not something that therefore you do unfreely because you still, you don't play tennis involuntarily. You know, you voluntarily enter the game. You also voluntarily have trained these skills. They are still governed by your free choice. And in doing so, you actually give yourself a greater range of choices. You actually increase your freedom. You don't diminish it. Even though there's a certain predictability that comes with that, that's actually part of your freedom. It's not against your freedom. And it's not a zero-sum game. So if you ask yourself, I mean, how, free, how many free choices have you made today? <laughs> Maybe not that many. Of course, that just was not, not a reason to deliberate consciously about something because certain things you already have deliberated and you are on autopilot with that. And that's perfectly fine. That's still part of your free deliberate choice that you made earlier. And so even if you don't make that many choices per day, that's not a zero-sum game between free choices and all the other habits you have in life. No, it's, um, it's uh, taking that I mean, as one thing. It's governed by your freedom and therefore an expression of your freedom. And that is very important because we increasingly are also responsible for the habits that we develop. There's a sense of self-formation that comes with that. We are responsible for who we have become as we grow older. We are responsible even for the character that we have, because character is something habitualized after all. We are um, we are responsible for ignorance that we shouldn't have. You could have gained that knowledge if you had paid attention. And vice versa, we typically like to own that as an achievement if it's something good. We typically disown it if we, if we don't like it, you know, but uh, we are actually responsible in either case. So there are things that have become second nature to us. There are habits, skills, virtues, as Thomas Aquinas says. Uh, virtues are moral skills of that sort. I mean, you can, uh, um, an example, you know, if Mother Teresa were still alive, right? I could predict that she's not going to kill me, right? Does that mean she doesn't have free will? 
No, it means uh, she is a person of charity, of virtue, and so forth. That makes her behavior predictable, but that's an expression of her freedom. It's not a diminishment of her freedom. Because freedom, and here's where I come to the very beginning back, I mean, freedom is for something good, ultimately for an ultimate good, but for any kind of good. And that means the better we become by second nature, the more free we are. So that I can predict that Mother Teresa is not going to kill me makes her actually more free and not less free. So we grow in freedom if we develop these kind of virtues, even though it can make us more predictable. But these routines that we then have are also disburdening us from the small stuff of life and make us able to take a bigger view of reality and consider larger goals and a greater good. And that is ultimately, of course, the ultimate universal good, I said in the beginning, is God. And we have a rational inclination to pursue this universal good by our will by an act of love. So we are then freed by the kind of things that we develop during life, the habits that we develop, to pursue this greater good. That is what makes us truly wise. And it sets us free, even though, as I said, this largest and ultimate good is not part of our free choice, because we all want to be happy. We all want to be with God at the end. Good. And I think here's where I stop. Perfect. We have just over 15 minutes for questions. So if there are any questions that the audience has for Father, I anticipate that we may be able to tackle three or possibly four, depending on how lengthy the questions end up being. Father, you're welcome to yes. the audience. Yes, I will that myself. Yes, please. Um, is free will a necessary condition for a life? Uh-huh. Um, as usual, it depends what we mean by love, right? Uh, so if you mean by love, you know, infatuation or addiction of some sorts, you know, that's of course not free. You know, that's, um, but the love of God, I think, requires that kind of freedom indeed. You know, and any love in the um, sense that we, so the, the will is of course a spiritual faculty. It's not uh, a feeling by which we are addicted to something. And therefore, if that, uh, if you mean that, if you mean that kind of love, that of course implies free will. So in that sense, we can love only freely, that's true. But, you know, uh, so not to confuse that either with choice. Choice can be a necessary means to that end. You know, if, you, if you're not free from your brain chemistry, you can also not pursue God. <laughs> but once you're face to face with God, it doesn't mean uh, you have a Choice, that's not the kind of freedom we are talking about there, but it's the freedom of the fulfillment in the end. But that's, that's an act of love. You know? It's the fulfillment of that love. Where there would be, there wouldn't be freedom, but then if free will is a prerequisite for feeling love, how would we feel the totality of God's love in heaven? Uh, again, freedom in that case does not mean free choice. So for Aquinas, we, are, we have free choice, free choice precisely because we are made for God. Because only God, therefore, can fulfill that desire, that rational desire for the good, for the ultimate good. Which means that all the subordinate goods, well, we can take them or leave them. You know, I mean, because we, um, we deliberate about them, as I said, by reason, we deliberate about them under that horizon of this most universal and ultimate good. And under that horizon, they all look finite and um, you know, preliminary and not the ultimate kind of thing. So we can take them or leave them. And that is why we have a choice about them, because they're finite and not the infinite good that we are looking for. Um, but uh, when it comes to God, of course, that's not the case anymore. And it doesn't need to be the case, because it always was only a means for that end. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a silly question, but where would you um, put the difference, if you see a difference, between this argument that we've seen here, well, you're not making decisions, your brain is, and to take a stark example, like the very childish, well, I'm not punching you, my hand is. Mm -hmm. Do you see any difference there? And where? Because, like, for me, that's both very similar, very obviously not the right thing. 
uh, not quite sure what the problem is. So if, if you know you have an alien hand syndrome and you're punching somebody, then... Well, that that in a sense, like, I can't, if I start distinguishing between me doing something and my body doing something, yeah. I run into a problem very quickly, right? So, where do you see the problem that my brain doing something instead of me taking the decision? Why is that a problem in the first place? Uh, well, because in one case you're free, the other you're not. It's just that you cannot see that by looking at your brain. Because in the brain it looks the same, basically. Or maybe you can, I don't know if you could find no way to solve that there, but. Uh, but the brain will be active in either way, you know, and these scientists say there's no difference between these cases. Um, but that means, uh, that doesn't tell you whether that is based on a free choice or not, because that doesn't appear in the brain, but nevertheless, if you make that choice, of course you have to use your arm. That means you have to use your nervous system, you have to use your brain, and uh, what is called the FDF. I forget the name. So, um, anyway, but the, the parts, you know, of the nervous system that like your muscles and so on. And Aquinas would say that. And that there's a stepwise process for him there. Um, so it's the implementation of the choice. But there's a difference, you know, yes, there's a sort of, if you want an epistemic problem, you know, how do you look, how do you discern that difference by just looking at your physical operation of the body? Maybe you cannot. But that's not, that's a different question from, you cannot say because I cannot discern that there, there's no difference. That doesn't follow. You know, there's a different question. There's an ontological question. There's an epistemological question about that. Right? Um, and but the, the place where that is usually deliberated is not the neurophysiological laboratory. It's the courtroom. Right? <coughs> and the courtroom is going to look at you in your life, the deliberations that you you know uh, have in your life world, and the way we normally behave. Uh, of course, there is no foolproof method. I mean, any kind of jury must have ended in your court. But I mean, that there's sim simply normal kind of ways in which we assess whether somebody is in his right mind, you know, or um, actually a time to think about things, you know, or premeditated something in the different categories of crimes, depending on that. So, but that's where that would be decided, not by doing brain MRIs or something like that. That's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said <clears throat> that um, free will is will toward the good, mm -hmm. all right, toward the good, and that involves knowledge. You would know something, knows the good, mm -hmm. and the will you just move toward that, that right. desire. So universalists, people, you know, universal salvation. Uh -huh. right? They will make the point that free will toward the good requires knowledge of the good. So that if you if you choose evil, if you choose wrong, you are in some to some degree ignorant. You're in some degree mistaken. Mm. If that is true, and they hold that it is, then ultimately if we do not choose God, ultimately, I mean, in the eschaton, if we do not choose God, mm -hmm. we do so out of ignorance. So we're not truly, ultimately responsible. And for that reason, God, being the loving Father, you know, pure being, pure goodness, is going to ultimately save all. Because he will not condemn you for a mistake, for ignorance. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you say to that? Well, uh, in heaven, as I said, we don't have choice, but here we do because we're not yet face to face with God. So we do know things as not being God, but we don't know God. Right? Right. So that's why we deliberate, and some of the choices we make will lead us in the direction and others don't. And, um, and that is where we still have free choice. And that's not just a matter of ignorance. I mean, Socrates would say that, right? So. Um, <laughs> But uh, then there is no sin. Sin would just be ignorance, and then nobody's at fault. And that is why, for Thomas Aquinas, the distinction between your mind and your will is important. So you have, you can only choose what you know, right? You can only love what you know. I mean, you can think a bit about that, but that seems to be self-evident, right? I mean, you cannot choose what you don't know. 
that means uh, your mind, the deliberation that goes with that, is a pre presupposition for free choice. A mere reflex doesn't have that. You know? So therefore, that's why that is not a free action. But it's only a presupposition. It's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Right? So it informs your mind. So Aquinas will talk about formal causality here. But the actual choice that effectively moves you towards that, the efficient cause, that's the will. And you, after all the information is in, you know, after you have reasoned everything out, you still have to make a choice. And you can say at least yes or no to that. And, and that is what you are responsible for. And so there is still a way of going wrong. And um, this side of heaven, you know, we have to make our choices and we are responsible for it. So I don't think universalism follows that way. There's a question back there. I was, um, uh, let's say there's an example of someone, you made the example of needing to sleep. Um, let's say you wake up at a certain point and you're just so absolutely exhausted that you just immediately turn off your alarm and fall back asleep. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, like, at what point is, um, you say deliberation is necessary to um, have free will, at what point is um, the need to fulfill natural, or like the desires we have, when does that like eclipse um, the deliberation for free will? Uh, I guess it would be a scale of, you know, I don't think I can say that in the abstract, but I mean, if you are so out of it that you cannot even deliberate anymore, then you're not responsible. You know? I mean, it's like, I mean, you were sad, right? <laughs> so it happens. And, uh, of course, I can scold you for that, but in a way, it's pointless because uh, there wasn't any choice you had about that. Um, sometimes we, of course, have um, earlier deliberations. That's like the person who is getting, who's driving drunk. You know, of course, if you're drunk, you, you cannot deliberate. You know, and you will do wrong things. But you are responsible for being drunk. That happened earlier. You know. And if you didn't set your alarm properly, or you put your alarm in such a way that you could drowsily put it off, you know, I mean, you. you can think ahead of time uh, uh, with, about these things. And so, but how to make a scale out of that, I cannot tell you that. You know, that's, uh, I don't think there's a scale. That, that's sort of common sense, uh, I guess, that term was what used there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that the truth of God, when you, um, when you reach heaven, is subjective or universal, and does it grow or change uh, as you get older? Or, or as you personally think? It depends how you lead your life. <laughs> if, uh, if you grow in virtue like Mother Teresa, you know, heaven uh, will become more transparent to you even in this life, I would think. And the good you, uh, will be more obvious to you and you will more happily do it. You know? So there's a growth going in that direction. But if you go the other way, I mean, you may end up in what, the, what we would call vice, and vice actually makes you less free. It's also a habit, but it's going in the wrong direction, and it makes you less free. It ties you to the temptations that you're pursuing. You ultimately might get, might get addic addicted to things, you know, and so that actually, um, and it narrows your scope. You know, somebody who is addicted to drugs, I mean, the drug becomes the whole world. That's a very narrow world in which you live, whereas if you develop virtue, that widens your horizon and makes you are aware of the universal good of things and so forth. And so Wittgenstein, I think, says that somewhere, that the happy person lives in a very different world from the unhappy person, and I think that's probably what, what that means, you know? The happy person is the one that has become good, you know, and is free in that. That's, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah? I think you had a question, the gray short? No? Yeah. Can you explain what are, how does free will imply total submission to the level of God? Free will and total submission to the will of God. Um, well, if the fulfillment of our freedom is God, God is identical with his will. You know? <clears throat> God is simple, and so he's, he is his will. Um, that would be the same thing, basically. If you love God, you want to do his will. You can call it submission, but... Um, if you really understand that, it's actually not sort of, it's not, this sounds oppressive, right, if you say a submission. But uh, it is actually uh, something you do spontaneously. You will want to do it, right? 
it is a submission to the will of God, obviously, but it's not an oppressive kind of situation. So um, again, if, you, if you're virtuous, you do the good spontaneously, and that is uh, at the same time doing the will of God. Does that make sense? Maybe. Yes. So, Father, in the beginning of your talk, you described how it is important to kind of contextualize our use of the word freedom in, in political terms. So, my question is are there any political systems that you would identify that inherently do violence to free will? Or the, or the practice of, of habituating virtue such that you can act freely? I mean, obviously, I mean, totalitarian regimes would be of that sort, and <clears throat> but it's precisely because they treat human beings as, say, machines, you know, as cogs in the in the machinery or something like that, uh, without using their mind and their deliberation. So you will be brainwashed by propaganda or like in George Orwell or something like that. <clears throat> and uh, you are made part of a machinery um, of the army or the economy, whatever the case may be, um, that doesn't take your own spontaneity, creativity, uh, deliberation into account. And so that would be sort of pushing you around like me throwing the stone at somewhere <laughs> rather than dropping it in free fall. Um, now, <clears throat> given our situation, you know, we are not always good, you know, and we are not always spontaneously doing the good thing. So often there will be indeed submission to laws that we don't like, but that are necessary for the common good. So you might not like the traffic laws, but, you know, <laughs> uh, still you follow them. And um, that, in fact, you know, if the laws are reasonable and uh, you can identify with that, that can be also a way in that sets you free, right? I mean, because it's educational in a way. Now, whether a law is of that sort or not is still a question, and some laws can be oppressive or unjust. You know? So it depends. And, but, um, so what we call totalitarian, though, I would think is something that treats us like material kind of entities or animals that are being trained behavioristically or something like that. That would be against our human nature, which has at its highest capacities you know, uh, reason and free will. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, I, I just wondered, uh, you're talking a lot about freedom mm -hmm. in regards to, uh, I, I guess my question is just, are we free to believe God? To believe God? To have faith? Is, is faith something that's, ah. that is by virtue of our autonomous free will? Yes. So, the, I mean, that's... Uh, Faith, of course, that's now a theological question, uh, is a gift of grace. <laughs> that can go off like that line. <laughs> no, so, uh, uh, it's only, so faith is a gift. So grace is a gift. Grace is freely given. It's part of its definition. But that is not completely different even from a natural sense in which God is involved in our life, because God is the first cause of all things. If God doesn't move the universe, nothing is going to move. Right? God is the actualizer of all things. We are a secondary cause, Thomas Aquinas says. So without God's pre-motion, as some of the Thomists say, nothing moves, including ourselves, including even our free will. So our free will is dependent on God, but that's not against our freedom. That's the thing. That's, uh, that's always hard to understand. And um, so for that, you have to keep in mind what I said earlier, that God is our ultimate end. That means God is not only the first efficient cause, as we say, that moves things, but also the ultimate final cause, namely that for which we move. Now, if you think of that which you truly and desperately want, the ultimate thing you absolutely want with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, right? And that is at the same time that which moves you to itself. Does that do violence to you? No, it fulfills your nature and it actually sets you free in doing so. So if God's, and God's grace moves you to believe in him, that involves your will, but in such a will, way that the will is actually set free. It's not a, otherwise it would be violent kind of motion from the side of God. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but that's, uh, so it, 
we are free, and, but that freedom itself depends on the grace of God. Yes? I actually thought about that question. Um, it, faith is experienced um, well, in many different ways, but even very faithful people and very uh, theologically educated people can experience genuine difficulties to faith, mm -hmm. um, genuine intellectual obstacles to believing. And so, how would you explain at the personal level of someone? Uh, how would you describe freedom in that sense, where uh, maybe up until that morning when they learned some scientific study, mm -hmm. um, they were in free fall towards God, right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you know maybe someone being convinced by Lebet not being aware of your critique of it, saying, "Oh gosh, well I don't know if, if this or that uh, faith is true." Um, how would you uh, chart the territory of freedom mm -hmm. in that situation? So there was John Henry Newman, or who it was, who said, I mean, a thousand difficulties don't make a doubt. <laughs> uh, I mean, so I think we would look at that and say, okay, I'm startled by this. I don't know what to say to that, you know, and, um, but do I doubt my faith because of that? Or is that just an invitation to wrestle with something? Is that an invitation to grow by looking more closely at it? And, you know, I mean, we Thomas typically we want to engage, so we enjoy that <laughs> difficulty, right? So, uh, in a way, I think uh, the f what true faith is, is also to be fearless in the face of that. You know? And, you know, sometimes we have to talk back, maybe we, we are afraid or something like that, but to remind ourselves, you know, our faith can take that, so to speak, you know? And I don't have to have all the answers right away, but uh, I also don't run away from that into obscurantism or something like that, you know, superstition or whatever. I mean, no, I want I want to study the science. I want to know what's there. I want to live in the real world. And I don't think that's ultimately contradicting my faith, and I have that trust. And so I would, so anybody who's struggling with that would invite them to go into that direction. And we have that freedom, I think. I mean, apart from the grace question, of course. You know. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah.